Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. You are certainly. And today we're going to talk about naturally healthy pets or how to keep Fido alive without taking out a second mortgage. So <laughs> I'm always amazed how much people will spend on their pets. I mean, dogs and cats, you know. I mean, six, seven, Okay, $8, you wouldn't $8, even $8. have a dog or a cat, no. so you're not a good judge of this. I'd say, hey, this one was free. I'm sure there's another one. <laughs> you used to tell me when we lived in Europe, you know, Annie, they have cats in France. They have dogs in France. You don't have to bring ours. Every time I wanted to get a dog, you'd be like, uh-huh. no, 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 we're not doing that. Uh-huh. You get mad. Okay, so Annie, tell us <laughs> how to keep these little adorable creatures alive. All right. Well, we're not going to use your definition of that. But Uh well, so everything just like with humans starts with food. And that's the basis of health for all critters. And lots of critters come, uh, especially ones that might end up in in a, a shelter situation, probably haven't come from the best environment. They And they probably have all been fed dry food at the lowest rung of the dry food ladder that's full of grains and um, corn and all the ways that we're eating that make us sick. Well, that's in the dog food and the cat food now. So, so just to tell a little story. So we had a dog that found us when we first came back from Europe. Um, she was a, a great Pyrenees and, uh, and she was very thin and she looked like she was going to die and her jaw had been broken. So she couldn't eat very easily and her hip had been broken. And so she didn't want to leave. She loved the kids, and she just would stay and stay, and then she'd go away for, you know, an hour or two and then come back. So I started feeding her, and, we, and I started feeding her fish. And by eating the fish, she could, swallow, she could chew it enough and swallow it, and, and then she would get sick. So that told me her gut was sick. So I started to work on her gut. Um, I, I made up um, – so I was giving her raw fish – and I was giving her raw tuna because I could buy a lot of it, you know, like pretty cheaply. Mm-hmm. And um, I also fed her something that I made up called Vitasup, which had uh, a lot of things that she needed for any anything to be healthy. But it had crude protein and fat and fiber, calcium, phosphorus, dried uh, yeast powder from something like brewers or nutritional yeast, kelp powder, lecithin, wheat germ. Wheat bran, sorry, bone meal, vitamin C, and garlic powder, and all those things put together. Uh, she liked the taste of that. Almost any dog or cat would like it. And so she she started eating the fish for me, and then she started to gain some weight, and then she started to lose her hair. Yeah, well, and this is a dog that was really close to death. Yeah, her she had this huge head. I couldn't understand how she could have such a huge head and then almost no body, but she was literally starved to death. So she started to gain weight, and um, and she was, like, a lot more attentive and everything. And, and then she started losing her hair. So I thought, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? So I looked it up, and there was a lot of mercury in the fish. And so I was hurting her while at the same time I was trying to help her. So so anyway, I decided to switch to raw turkey. You could buy ground raw turkey. And that's what I started to feed her. And then eventually I moved on to having my own chicken, which I ground up in my KitchenAid, and we'd grind up the bones and everything into the food. And it was like I looked up one day, and here was this beautiful dog. She had gained weight. Her hair looked great. She was so happy to be with us. And I realized then that really it is always going to be about the food if we want to be healthy, whatever that is. So what I would do When I made food for her, and again, there are books out there. You can go online and look up all this stuff. Um, uh, it's It's all very doable. So what I'm suggesting is if you have an animal that has health issues, the first thing you should look at is is what are you feeding it. And then I think you want to move away from what you're feeding it and start doing some things with some raw food so the body and the immune system can recover. And then you can do some research on an easier way to feed your animal. Um, you can buy plans. You can get food in the mail. You can buy frozen food at, at most any grocery store now that has its own little frozen food section just for raw food that's made up for dogs and cats. Really? Frozen food for dogs? 
Yeah, but I'm yeah. You're, okay, we're, don't we're give me that a, look. Don't we're give taking me... out a second mortgage here. Yeah, no, no. So what uh-huh. I did TV dinners for your dog. TV dinners for dogs. All uh-huh. right. So so people a lot of people that have pets sincerely do care for their animal and they don't want it to be sick. So if you get an right. animal that's been eating some of the kinds of food that are available commercially, they're going to get diabetes, kidney failure, asthma, all the things that humans get. And you're going to say, oh, my gosh, I don't want my animal to die. That's so painful. Well, I remember when you were dealing with some of these animals, you would always say, well, what would they be eating naturally? Yes, that's In the wild. And you say, all right, it's going to be primarily raw meat. Well, protein. Yeah, some sort of, and maybe some plants. Uh, the well, grain what, that what might would be, be in the, the gut stomach. Of the, right. So if you're a cat and you ate a mouse, there would be a certain amount of grains, probably grains but in the stomach. But just a wee little bit. Yeah, not very much. So And, and cats actually need 99% protein to stay really super healthy. So then what are the commercial cat and dog foods made of, like rice and corn and... I mean, I look well, at the ingredients. Well, rice is okay, but here's the challenge. Here's but that's the challenge. not what they'd eat in nature. No, but you can't always uh, uh, make that happen. But here's the thing of what they are eating is is horrible stuff that has lots of antibiotic in it coming from animals that people be, – meat that people are eating. So the waste products of those uh, butcherings, um, butchered animals are being ground up and put into these feeds. So we're injecting all kinds of antibiotic – and other kinds of problems that that animal probably had by being in a feedlot somewhere. So we have to move away from that. Anyway, so here's, here's what I made. I, my raw food uh, recipe for the kittens that I used to foster um, came out of a book called Natural Nutrition. And, um, and so what I would do is I would grind up meat and bones and uh, organic egg, which I produce myself, and raw oats, brewer's yeast, and then I would put in my Vitasup recipe, and um, and then they would eat it. And if they were being fussy, so they were kittens that were really sent because they were going to die uh, from the shelter, and it was a no-kill shelter. So what I would do is to take a little tiny dollop of the food I made and put it in the middle of the dish and then I would take the food they'd been given and were used to and put that, make a ring around it like it's a donut. And so every day they would have to eat more and more of the food. They'd accidentally get a taste of it by licking and chewing and biting the food that they were used to. So, and that's how I would get them uh, to, to eat the foods so I wanted them So you'd wean them, them off the stuff they were eating that yeah. was bad for them. Right, and, and help them to develop a taste for the stuff I wanted them so to eat. So that if you serve a meal and it's in a donut shape with something <laughs> that I like on the outside, right, or on the inside. I never inside. thought of that, but I really should try that <laughs> with you. I've been redirected here with yeah. some kibbles, you know, yeah. sprinkled Just in the Just think middle. of that. So, so here's some foods that really animals should avoid, but especially if the animal has a health challenge. Um, so first of all is that a lot of that processed dog and cat foods, which contain all kinds of things that produce sugar in the dogs and cats, and that's how they end up with things like diabetes and cancer. So there are some foods that are, are good, and I some dry foods that are good. We call them extruded foods or processed foods. I have recently seen some articles saying that they that these new foods that don't have the grains in them are killing the animals. Well, I'd want to see who sponsored that survey. Well, the, some of them are super expensive, too. Well, they're expensive because they don't have waste, horrible waste from sick animals right. in the food. And they seem like they're pretty much like wild animal based, like the salmon and caribou and yeah, All we'll see. I, I'm not sure. I don't want to speak to that. Who knows? Maybe that. it's Joe Salmon and Fred Caribou. That's right. You know? our, our animals seem to do fine on those foods, and then they do they do get raw foods. They get raw vegetables. They Whatever's coming out of the kitchen, they get raw fruits, and they get raw eggs mm-hmm. um, pretty much every day. So sugar is never good for pets, and, and it isn't good for humans. And some of the words that you'll see in some of these um Packages will show you things like, uh, you know, it'll say beets or brown sugar or corn sweeteners or glucose or there's so many names for sugar um, that are hidden in those in those products. But it, the goal is to try to stay away from that. So 
dogs and cats should not have chocolate. Dogs are um, extremely allergic. Their to- chocolate is um, uh, uh, poisonous to, I almost killed a dog once. You bought me a box of uh, Lady Godiva chocolates for Christmas, and Ginger's sitting there begging, so I let her have one, and the next thing, we're at the vets because she's going to die. Well, and that dog, uh, Sophie, <laughs> <laughs> broke into the bag of Oreos, and fortunately, there's almost no chocolate. No, it's a, I, I was like, oh my God, she ate every Oreo cookie. And I said, give me the package I have to see. And the very last ingredient was chocolate. So she only pooped <laughs> Just black. Just trace amounts. That's right. She only po- pooped black, uh, black yeah, fake chocolate for two days. That's more info than But she want. was fine. Anyway, dairy products are uh, really hard on uh, both cats and dogs, but especially cats. And well, that's the- weird. Do you think of <laughs> no. eating a little bowl of milk? No, no, no. And it causes diarrhea. And you could kill a kitten. Uh, really? Yes, you could Jeez. kill a kitten. The people across the road did that, and I ended up with the kitten for three weeks mm. trying to bring it back from what you've, they had fed you've it. You just ruined half my childhood fantasies here. Okay. A little bowl of milk for the little kitty. All right, but usually those kittens are in a barn where there are milk cows, and that milk is not processed in any way, so it may be that it's a little kinder Plus they to get them. one or two squirts is all. Well, or in a dish. Plus, nobody follows them around to see what their poo looks like, so <laughs> we don't know. Or let's hope nobody does. <laughs> well, I mean, they get sick. So also certain kinds of grains because they need – Fat and they need protein, and grains produce sugar. So where's the balance in that feed that you're going to feed them? Also, commercial yeast, this is a fungus, and dogs have a hard time tolerating that. The kinds of yeast, if you will, yeast that they need are things like brewer's yeast and nutritional yeast, which are really minerals uh, that are super good for humans, all mammals. They should not consume alcohol. Now, uh, my mom did have a dog that loved my mom loved to have a drink in the evening. Um, I forget what she drank. It was like one continuous drink. <laughs> no, no. And I think she'd call it a highball, whatever that is. It but was anyway. mostly vodka. So she was feeding vodka to her no, dog? No, not, not on purpose, but sometimes oh, she would on have the drink yeah, sitting by it. No, no, buddy. I saw it happen. So this little, <laughs> this little schnauzer, she would wait patiently for my mom to be distracted. And maybe the phone would ring a or something. A schnockered schnauzer. Yeah. In those days, you had to go to the wall to talk on the phone because it had a cord and uh-huh. she'd look over and the dog would have drunk like all of the drink and be staggering and just fall over and uh, be asleep for the rest of the night. So, so besides being funny, it's not good for the animal, <laughs> no, right? It's not funny. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I'm sorry. But but it's ethyl alcohol, which is irritating to all of the soft membranes in every mammal. Sure. And a dog's a little soul, so mostly little souls and cats. I've never mm-hmm. known a cat to to drink alcohol, but I suppose it's possible. So um, the other thing that we can talk about is what other kinds of foods you could add to raw food. So I just mentioned that we could add vegetables. So you could cut up or put through a food processor different kinds of vegetables, green beans, uh, also fruits, dogs uh, like apples. Um, well, I know Sophie likes to go out and eat the tomatoes in our She garden. does, and they also have discovered persimmons. But then they also eat lots of poops from different things, so I don't really You keep bringing it back to poop. I don't, I don't know about this. Know. But the other thing that you can add that's really helpful um, once a week or so is add some a little bit of grated garlic, even though they say, you know, uh, dogs and cats shouldn't have garlic. It's a natural antibiotic, and it can be really helpful in fighting um, parasites. And also some cod liver oil a few times a week. Okay, well, let me interrupt you to remind everyone that you're listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke, reminding you that it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God, Annie. So you're talking about how to keep these drunk little dogs and cats (laughs) alive and healthy. Um, And we'll try and keep you out of the litter box here for a little while. And so tell um, tell us some more ways... To keep I don't these know. Animals, you're you're uh, not appreciating my skills here. Uh-huh. So, so what do you what do you do with a sick animal? What do you feed a sick animal? And one of the things, the first things I do, if I have a dog that or a cat that's eating a lot of grass, uh, they're doing that because it calms their stomach. Um, I don't recommend humans try this; they can't digest uh, grass. But uh, 
the the main thing is they're showing me something's not balanced in that system. And so it may be that they're not sick. Uh, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe they're stressed out. But so the first thing I would do if I see them eating um, eating grass or, or getting sick, uh, throwing up, is I'm going to get some powdered acidophilus, which is um, – uh, the the uh, bacteria that's in yo- yogurt, plain yogurt, not the stuff that has um, fruit in it and stuff. And then I'm going to offer that to them. And that's more than likely going to calm whatever is going on because it reintroduces the good bacteria because the bad bacteria is not balancing out. And when you talk about giving them acidophilus, how much are we talking about uh- a oh, tablespoon, a cup, no, a no, a it teaspoon. just would be like an eighth of a teaspoon. Is and then you put it on their food, or or you... in their mouth directly oh, in just... their mouth. Um, either way, it's probably better just to put it in their mouth, so it's not competing with the gastric juices that come from the food. Mm-hmm. Also, if they're ill, I would make special food for them. So I might decide I'm going to make up a diet of protein, vegetables, and grains, and the grains would be like wheat germ and raw oats or oat bran and maybe even uh, cooked brown rice. But didn't you just say the grains aren't good for them? These grains these grains are fine. It's corn and the byproducts of corn that's killing all mammals, not just dogs. Mm-hmm. So if they're not well, that stuff needs to be taken away, and you're going to see a change. So if you have a dog or a cat that has a very oily coat— you should take that food away because it's it's really making them sick. Um, you want to have a nice soft coat, a thick coat of hair. So that's the first thing that I notice when people introduce me to their pets is what does that what does that coat feel like and look like? Because it's going to tell me a lot about what they're eating. I know you had someone who had come to our farm. She had spent thousands of dollars at OSU's veterinary uh, with her dog. Uh, had some sort of skin rash, and it really just was what what she was eating. It was mange. It, no, it was mange. Oh. We changed everything, but we took away what they were doing because the dog was in total agony. And um, and then we made a mixture of acidophilus and, uh, into a like a cream uh, with uh, coconut oil. And then the dog was given that, was massaged with that a couple of times a day, and that took away all of the problem and plus change the food diet so that the dog had a lot better immune system because when it when an animal is in a lot of pain their immune system shuts down and I think that's what had happened um, I'd forgotten about that dog but that dog was one open sore it was so horrible she was just miserable um, so so we've done that a lot with things like mange um, to try to deal with uh, just just reestablishing a balance of bacteria on the animal um, or, or, um, or, and in the gut. So that's, that's pretty important. Also, animals often have a very um, tough time because they have an imbalance of minerals. So we like to feed kelp occasionally. Um, you can also offer some natural fats like coconut oil or even um, grass-fed beef tallow or lard that Again, if they're sick, you're not necessarily going to do that if there's nothing wrong. So what you're saying is like what Hippocrates said: let let food be your medicine. That's correct. It is our it is our medicine. Um, I also like vitamin E and vitamin A. Uh, vitamin E comes in a in a capsule in a yeah a capsule, and you can just p- poke it with a, a toothpick. And squirt that right into their mouth or onto their food, and they and they like that. And, of course, as I said, I also use acidophilus quite a lot for many different things. When we when we talk about how do we get the animals to, to eat some of these things, especially cats who tend to be finicky, there's a few bribe foods. So you could take some baby food um, like squash or spinach or even green beans um, and put a little a bit of that on the top of the food. They also like tomato sauce sometimes, uh, soy sauce, tamari sauce, or sardines in a can. Um, So you can take just a tiny bit of that and put that on that raw food that you want them to eat. Or you could put that around the edge of it so that when they're eating the food you're trying to transition them from, they they transition to eating the food taste, new taste they really like, to the food taste that they, uh, they aren't keen about. 
One of the things that's really a big problem for lots of cats, um, particularly kittens, is upper respiratory infection, URI. And so you'll see in uh, shelters, and a lot of cats are born with URI because they inherit it from their mother. And they'll usually have runny eyes. Um, they may cough a lot. And so one of the ways— Is this something like they call kennel cough? No, kennel cough is dogs, and that's different. But that has to do with the bacteria mold in the air. So it's not only they come into the kennel or into the shelter sick, but they can catch things yeah, while they're there. Yeah, that's really bad. It can be fatal, I believe. So they have vaccination for that. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so URI can it's not usually fatal, <clears throat> but it lasts the life of the animal. So you're going to want to consider that if you're adopting an animal, if it has runny eyes. But anyway, so so the the way that you give lots of cats medication, especially a antibiotic, is through their eye. So you use drops. And this is how um, your eyes can be treated. Now, that's not the way I treat it. Um, I like to use uh, L-lysine, L-lysine. And uh, it has a really good impact on it. It doesn't make it go away, but what it does is it helps the cat to arrest the symptoms. So particularly in the winter when it's cold outside and there's dry heat in the house and all that, that's when you usually see the symptoms once you get them under control. Um, so... So they do suffer unless you figure out how to take care of it. But the antibiotic at some point will stop working because the animal will develop an immunity to it. But the L-lysine, what I would do is it's a really big, I call a horse pill, <laughs> and I grind it up with a little, um, a little pedestal thing that I have. And then I can just put that on the top of the food and they'll, and they'll eat it for me. And it really does arrest the symptoms fairly Quickly. But this this treatment, like it sounds like with most of your treatments with the animals, is if you can make the animal healthy through diet and and I'll safe talk place into to their live, immune system. Yeah, then their body will essentially take care of itself. It tries for the most part. Yeah, and if it doesn't, this is the kicker here. So if you do these things with these remedies, and particularly if you have a remedy from a vet and it's not working then stop trying to pretend it's going to because the animal is suffering. So move on to maybe a more natural uh, solution or, or move on to something else because you can't just keep doing the same thing and expecting that it's going to work if it's not working. But if you've done everything you can and it's still not okay, then that's when you have to say that immune system is not going to step up to the plate to help heal this animal or, or help it to be healthy enough to have a good life. And you must have mercy and decide how you're going to end the life of that animal. Well, and that's so a, many people, though, who are so attached to their critters, they seem to just almost torture the poor beast, you know, wanting to keep it alive. It's this little shell of an animal. Yeah. Well, I don't blame people. I really don't because I don't want to... I don't want anything to happen to my cats and dogs, and I, as they get older, I think about that, and I worry about it, but I also have a plan of how I'm going to deal with it, and I know when it's time. So and I hope this plan doesn't involve puppies and kittens. Well, that's the next step, but we aren't <laughs> going to talk about that. So I don't want to even think about that. But it reminds me. me when Catelyn was just a little kid and her, and her dog had got hit by by a car on the road. And, oh, that was and so yeah, terrible. Yeah, it was so traumatic. And then <laughs> Not through like, her. I was the one who was terrible. Know, but we were standing at the grave after having buried this animal, and we're all kind of looking at Catelyn saying, is she going to get over this? And she looked up and was like, can we get a puppy? <laughs> I, like, I said, oh, take her no. away. Take her away, please. <laughs> anyway, so let's talk about some other options for healing. So golden seal, which is a, a natural uh, it's a medicinal plant, kills germs, and helps to shrink tissue. So you can get this in a, an elixir form. You can get it in a tincture form. And it's really great with kittens and cats um, to help them, especially if they um, are super, super sick. You can put it in the drinking water. Um, colloidal silver, uh, you can actually see online how to make this for yourself. But it is a very gentle antibiotic, and it works well. Um, to put in the mouth of um, kittens to help them. I've also used it for pink eye. 
um, very good for pink eye. It'll take pink eye right out in a human or a goat or whatever. So um, garlic, I already mentioned, is a great weapon. It is nature's strongest antibiotic. Um, very, very helpful. I already mentioned acidophilus. Bacteria fighting good bacteria, fighting bad bacteria is the best thing for the immune system so that you can reestablish balance. And acidophilus is a probiotic, right? It is probiotic, and that's what we do instead of antibiotic. We Mm -hmm. also use diatomaceous earth to treat for fleas and um, uh, different parasite issues. So uh, it, it works really great, and you can dust your house with it. You can dust the animal with it. You just don't want to breathe it, or you don't want them to breathe it. And I also use something called Arnica. It's a medicinal plant. It's, um, you can get it in a homeopathic form, uh, which is you know distilled down, or you can use it in a cream, or you can use it as a tea. Uh, it's very great for trauma. So if an animal has had trauma, whether it's an injury or a shock, uh, very good for any mammal. Super, super good. Um, so let's just talk a bit about feral and fearful behavior uh, before we come to the end. And that has to do with the fact that animals, when they transition, so let's say they've been in a shelter and they're very depressed or they've been coming from a different location to be with you, there's going to be some trauma. Or a stray. Yeah, a stray for sure. Uh, so we had uh, we had a, a cat that um, in, got dumped at our farm, and um, and she she was really crazy feral, and uh, so we brought her in and we put her in a safe snuggy location so she was safe, and um, and then every day I fed her a mixture of Bach remedies, Doctor Bach remedies, um, walnut oil, larch oil, and rescue remedy, and I. And because I was feeding her, she did take the remedy. It was on the remedy. And it took about two weeks before when I came near her, she didn't reach out to try to claw me to death and hiss at me and try to bite me. And I would say within a month, she came to the milk room and while I was milking and licked my hand. And I hadn't really touched her during that time. But those remedies reestablish balance in the nervous system, and they're really helpful for an animal that has to have surgery or travel or if they're going to give birth, um, if there's going to be a substantial change in their life. They, they don't make them drunk. They just ask that nervous system to create balance for the human, uh, the, for the mammal. It could be you. You're going to take a test. Uh, you're going to go sign a deal to borrow a million dollars. So I'll be less feral. Okay, we'll go with that. All (laughs) right, whatever. All right. Well, you've been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We want to thank our award-winning producer, Adam Rich, who loves every cat and dog that crosses his path. We also want to thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother hopefully told you, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Uh, Let's see. Well, play nice with others, clean up your own mess, and adopt animals from the shelter. There's too many in the world as it is. All right. Until next time. You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at BlueRockStation.com. Yeah.